Good morning, and welcome to Caregiver Support Group. Uh, before I introduce today's special presenter, I have a short announcement. I just wanted to remind everyone that next month's presentation will be Selling the Family Home uh, with Pam Cloud. She's with Keller Williams. That will be on Thursday, April the 17th, uh, in the Phillips Conference Room on the lower level. So hopefully you can come to that. I wanted to let you all know that uh, Becky Hook and I are so excited to introduce today's presenter. He happens to be a faculty member here at WCU. And in the fall, I attended his 55 and up uh, senior expo at Immaculate College. The information I collected <laughs> there was invaluable. I hope he continues his work for seniors in PA. And uh, he is here, he, he is, uh, from the 167th District State Representative, Dr. Joanne Mill. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much, Joyce, and certainly delighted to be with everybody here. Uh, Joyce and I were just uh, comparing a few notes, and we were thinking that I can be as, as really audience directive as, as you all would like me to be. So I, I don't have a real set format other than just trying to be available and accessible. So whatever direction the group wants to go is fine by me. I, I enjoy the, the conversation and the, and the dialogue. What I thought I could do just to give you a, maybe a couple starting points is I was going to give you just a little bit of the overview about how the legislature works and that way you can probably piece in where your particular issues might fit. And that makes some difference about how you can advocate for certain issues that I'm sure this group is interested in. But the way the legislature in Pennsylvania is set up is we have 100, uh, well, 203 members in the House side, and then there are 50 state senators. On the House side, each of us represents, with a redistricting that was completed as part of the 2010 census, of course, every 10 years per James Madison, starting with back in 1790, we count the country, and we figure out how do you get exactly the same number of constituents or customers, and this is important because in our world, hey, our constituents, or what some people might call voters, they're our clients, just like with human services organizations, those are, of course, the clients of those kind of groups. Our job is to keep our clients as satisfied as we, as we can in terms of the kind of policies we put in place, the kind of laws that we support, and the kind of services we can talk about that we make available for the citizens. A district like ones around here in southeastern PA, where obviously I'm sure most people here live, you have very compact districts. So the 156th, where Westchester itself was located, the 167th, which is mine just to the east of here, West Whiteland, going back toward East Town. All these districts have to have exactly the same number of people. And by the latest census count, there are 12.7 million Pennsylvanians in this Commonwealth. So it works out to roughly 62,500 people are each house district of the 203 in the state. So that's important because as important as any given issue is to you and your group, Representative also is trying to balance, obviously, input, advice, comments, suggestions about the state system or otherwise from 62,499 other people. So part of any advocacy activity is just about are you keeping visible in front of that representative? Are you coming to their events like, like Joyce did? Are you visiting their local office? Because one of the things you do in this job, and it was what I was doing right before I came here, is I was in my local office in Malvern, like I'm sh sure Dan Truitt is here in the 156, and, and you're meeting with constituents, coming in for doctor's appointments every 15 minutes, a half hour, so they can press me on all kinds of issues, whether it's tr the transportation and continuing outflow from, from that, when, was, when is the Paoli tra Intermodal Transportation Center going to get built? Is Westchester really going to privatize? Okay. I got a, the people I was meeting with this morning actually were there, uh, to your, sort of close to your milieu, they were there for the housing partnership of Chester County and a nonprofit organization that 
tries to help make homes available for low and moderate income individuals in the county. And there are some state dollars that go into that, that issue. It's run through the county, but the state does put some dollars into that program. So each of us is trying to satisfy our clients in that district. And I raise that for those couple of reasons, but also because it, it makes some difference in terms of the agenda that is salient in that district. I mean, a district like mine, just to the west of here, which is really just the end of the main line, candidly is a very affluent district. And the reality is the kind of human services needs are very different than what's gonna be right here in the 156, which includes the borough of Westchester. It could be very different than what you might be finding in some of the districts in Upper Darby and moving toward the city of Philadelphia. And it could be very different than the <laughs> districts that are where my wife is from, Berks County. We're going to go my mother-in-law's 85th birthdays this weekend, so we're, we're going up there. Where it's a very rural farming kind of district. An interesting fact to think about the array of this, okay, because a district like where my mother-in-law lives, farmlands, okay, that's a very different type of requirement in terms of supporting the family farms, supporting people that rely on agriculture for their living. It's gonna be a different kind of care and support those individuals might want. There was one reason last year we eliminated the inheritance tax on family farms in many cases. So the families could pass on the family farm to the next generation because what we were finding is a lot of families as the kids or the grandkids came into their time to take the farm. Financially, it was just unsustainable to keep the farming going. And it was a need to try to put less fiscal burden on that transfer. And farming communities up there, ethos-wise, will, will tell you that they, broad brush stuff here, but they will tell you that they don't need government, and government should be very limited, and government should just stay out of the way in their minds for better or for worse. But staying out of the way in part to them meant eliminating the inheritance tax on family farms. Farming, hey, believe it or not, it shocks people in this area who live in and around the general developed part of this area. Agriculture is the number one industry in Pennsylvania. Hey, the number one industry in Pennsylvania is agriculture. I raise that at my town hall meetings. I live in Malvern area. Hey, Malvern, Westchester, Exton, it's the most developed part of the state. It is shocking to people to learn that. But it's the number one industry in the state, which means I will tell you candidly, there are a lot of legislators that agriculture, in terms of policies you're willing to support, in terms of where you think dollars should go, in terms of what agenda items you think should be prioritized, that is a very big push and concern for them about how you maintain the traditional farmland kind of communities. What does it mean for them in terms of what kind of roadways they want, in terms of getting people to work, right? One of the big pushes with the transportation bill that we passed in November 2013 was in part about putting a lot of money at making it available at least for SEPTA, okay? mass transit, in part because we're trying to figure out how do we get lower income individuals okay, who may be the only wage earner in their family from Philadelphia, Upper Darby, certain other places in Delaware County, they're coming out my way to the Great Valley Corporate Center, which I represent, to take jobs out there, the so-called reverse commute. Many of these individuals, of course, don't have cars, don't have vehicles, may not even have a license. So mass transit, very, very important to both my employers in my district and also those citizens. And so interesting alliance there of, of suburban legislators and city legislators working together to make sure mass transit uh, for family sustaining reasons and support care reasons. Because uh, a lot of these workers come out and work in the assisted living facilities out here, uh, come in the nursing homes out here. I mean, they are a very key part, obviously, providing that support care personnel that a lot of these entities around here, a uh, Manor Home, a uh, Chester Valley Rehab, Paoli Hospital, Chester County Hospital, a heavy reliance on workers coming from the city outs. And, and then that's why there's a lot of emphasis on the mass transit. However, to us, that's common sense, right? Because we live here, we see it, we get it. Let me tell you, my colleagues from the farmland parts of the state, from the more rural parts of the state, think SEPTA is a complete waste of money, and they can't understand 
why we are subsidizing public transportation. And we've thought there's basically a perception that SEPTA, for better or for worse, is a font of waste, fraud, and abuse. Okay? And so getting something through anything is in part about trying to battle through differing, conflicting perceptions in the state about what makes sense. And ultimately, to get something through, you've got to find 102 of people like me on the House side, 50%, 26 state senators, 50% right, plus one, and one governor willing to sign an idea, a bill, into law. Okay. Not a simple process, particularly when you come at it from a state that's got 12.7 million people who are all rooted in very different districts, with different cultures, beliefs, ethos, values, attitudes, and you have the classic conflict of agendas that happens. So what might seem to make sense to you in your world, in my world, may be anathema to somebody else in another part of the state. And it is a fascinating part of the process of trying to figure out how we get policy through a state of this range. So the takeaway there, among other things, is each of those districts hey, has the same numerical number of people, hey, even though the, the geographic swath is very different from the very, very compact Philadelphia districts to the more slightly spread out suburban districts to the more rural parts of the state. Every district is 62,500 people and the Supreme Court is very, very stringent about not allowing variation on that number for a whole host of civil rights reasons. It'd probably lecture for another day. But that's the world that someone like me comes in. And when you think about advocating with a representative for issues I know are important to this group, you gotta think about what is their worldview, right? What kind of district are they coming out of? And what is the agenda that they are salient about, that's salient to them? in terms of the kind of jobs their citizens have, the kind of prevailing affluence their citizens take into the, the, uh, uh, the workplace. And does mass transit mean something or not, right? If there's a place where there are a lot of people that are working, okay, two family incomes, right? And that's actually, interestingly enough, in some ways more of an issue in my kind of districts. The, uh, the two family, the two people wage earners. Uh, you have a slightly less barbell effect there because the city districts and the rural districts, uh, for different reasons, there may be more um, incidents of adults, of some adult being home during the day. Uh, my kind of districts, actually, in part because they're suburban districts, they're the affluent districts, uh, we have the highest percentages of two income, two wage earner kind of families and all the issues that, that go with that. So for example, my PTO moms, okay, in terms of support and care, want to see more money put into after school programs. Not necessarily because it's anything to do with academic enrichment, but because this is a way to extend the school day for obviously providing care for their child. And I have an eight year old son, so I certainly understand the parental realities of this. Okay. The farming communities, they think that's really an unwarranted use of public dollars. Okay. Many districts that I represent, okay, they would like to see less money at all be put into so-called cyber schools. Okay. Cyber schools in my kind of suburban district, in most of the southeast suburban districts, cyber schools are under heavy criticism by the general citizens I represent for a number of reasons, and I can go into those if you want, for a number of reasons. Opposite city of Philadelphia districts, okay, those parents, in terms of support and care for their kids, they are among, believe it or not, people are sometimes surprised about this, they're among the most vociferous, enthusiastic advocates of cyber schools, uh, of any type of demographic in the state. And not necessarily, interestingly enough, because uh, I am on the Education Committee, and we did testimony on this, not necessarily for academic enrichment or academic options per se. That's part of it. But it was so fascinating to me 
the parent after parent, when they came and testified for us about why cyber schools should be basically given more money in the state, and we can talk about that, that budget pie that's part of this packet, more money should be given to cyber schools, is because they argue, we want to do it because we think it's safer for our kids. Okay. Academics, we think there's some good magnet schools that we could still use for an academic option, but we think it's safer for our kids to have the cyber option. So we can keep a better eye on them. They're not exposed to, obviously, all the social ills and the criminal uh, behavior that may be, unfortunately, too rampant in, in some areas down there. Okay, so you've got to always be thinking about how does the worldview of the legislator get shaped by the kind of geographic district and area of the state that one is coming out of. And I'll just kind of close this one by, by saying the reality is for the state, when you think about advocacy, roughly 45% okay, of all of Pennsylvania, roughly 45% of all of Pennsylvania lives in the general southeast quadrant of the state. Right? This is the population base which also means we, by extension, have the most number of representatives. So that's, that's a power base. Is population produces basically more representatives for you. This figure of 203 is a fixed cap. So every 10 years, it's like a giant chessboard. And they've got to move people around and shift district lines so that you always have the same number of people in each district. Baker versus Cardin. Supreme Court case that says this shall be so. Okay. So it advantages us in the sense that if you've got issues that you want to advocate for statewide, it's a good place to be from as the Southeast because we have the most number of representatives because the 45% of the whole state lives in and around us. Also means, and this continuing contention across the legislature, it also means that very, very roughly this area of the state produces about 50% of that revenue budget pie that's part of this handout. Okay. Almost half the entire state budget comes from the southeast. So we're the breadbasket of Pennsylvania in terms of where the state gets money to turn around and distribute for health care, for education, for transportation, for <coughs> agriculture, whatever the issue may have become, be of concern to someone. So, for example, when we were trying to get this transportation bill done back in November, and some of my rural colleagues would stand up and rant and rave, but how can we subsidize SEPTA with the people's tax money? I don't want my money going to SEPTA. Okay. Somebody from the suburban counties would stand up and point out that in many of your rural districts, the road cost per mile is actually far more subsidized by the state because there are no vehicles, there are no tolls. Okay. On a per capita, per citizen basis, the roads in rural Pennsylvania are far more expensive than SEPTA in a per capita basis. Okay. So all it comes down to, in many cases, is where's your worldview? And that is important because your worldview is guiding what you think makes sense for policy. People don't have a car, well, they should figure out a way to get to work, right? If your employers need these individuals, well, they should just hire a bunch of vans and go pick them up and drive them back out. And th those are the kind of arguments that come up, okay? So you always got to be thinking about that, that world view. And I also sort of close on this point by noting, uh, I know this is caregivers probably writ large, but what is so fascinating about Pennsylvania is we are essentially the third oldest state in the United States in terms of age demographics. So this is a very old state, if you want to use that terminology, and we will apparently. So <laughs> very old state, and that obviously has a lot to do with the kind of support care issues that the legislature is interested in and is prioritizing. One of the macro level um, goals that is being sort of the, the benchmark is how do you basically push the funding formula away from such heavy reliance on traditional nursing homes and try to push it more toward 
assisted living facilities, continuing care facilities, and probably even more to, of importance, community-based and individual-based kinds of opportunities for citizens that, for example, may, if they get a visit once a day, once a week from a visiting nurse, they may not have to go into a traditional nursing home. Is it about redefining a, the definition of caregiver? Okay. This was a major push about two years ago where in the state, hitherto, the definition of caregiver in terms of whether somebody was eligible for reimbursement from the state for providing care for somebody was in effect about whether or not the caregiver was a blood relative of the person. So if you are trying to keep an elderly relative out of the nursing home, right, and you know that the once a week visit from a community agency, a visiting nurse, whatever else, is what's going to keep that person able to be at home, okay, you could not basically access the reimbursements, which obviously of course you need to be able to support the care you're giving, unless you're a blood relative. A lot of that, of course, is, is tradition and custom. So the state said, well, we've got this macro level goal. Okay? We know that nursing homes traditionally are the most expensive care option for, for seniors. We know that based on all kinds of quantitative data, seniors themselves have the least preferred methodology for them would be nursing homes, right? People don't want to go there, generally speaking. So we had a great match there, what citizens wanted and what the government was looking to do. And we made a couple of tweaks in terms of the law that has produced great results, in part based on the feedback from citizens that we want to be able to keep our early citizens, relative or not, at home. And the state has an interest in doing this because we can save, obviously, billions of dollars by keeping people out of nursing homes as long as possible. So we made a simple, what on the surface seems like a simple definitional change. We basically loosened up the definition of caregiver to allow non-relatives in many circumstances to be the eligible recipient for the reimbursement. So family farm, Berks County, all grandmom's kids had moved away to California, North Carolina, wherever else. Obviously we have a much more mobile society today. Kids aren't necessarily staying in their same immediate area anymore. The average person moves every 10 years these days, which is phenomenal to even think about. So in many cases, maybe it's the neighbor, the unrelated neighbor, who's checking in on that citizen to make sure that they are eating properly, to make sure they've taken their medicines, to make sure that they have taken any type of uh, doctor's visits that, that need to get done. They need to be driven to that visit. Hey, we changed the law and said, look, if the reality of, of life is, because of the changing demographics, that it's the non-relative that in many cases may be providing the care, the neighbor next door, the person up the street, let's change the law and say that person can actually be eligible for the reimbursements. Hey, because it helps that citizen who needs the help, and it helps the state, because we keep people out of nursing homes. There was a big push with the about same time, about two, three years ago, to substantially rewrite all the assisted living codes and regulations in the state. Because we were saying, if we're going to make an emphasis on trying to encourage that part of the aging process, assisted living facilities, one of the complaints that we were getting, and I would, can attest that I certainly received any number of those from constituents that came to visit me, is allegations about whether a resident was not being treated properly for whatever reason. Okay, we're all familiar with that. Some with merit, some not, but the reality is there were certainly instances, and some well-publicized instances, where that did take place. So the aging committee, which is, I was on at the time, it's what we call the Senior Citizen Committee in Pennsylvania, called the Aging, aging and Older Adults Committee is what we call it. We completely rewrote the regulations for assisted living and tried to put a whole new level of scrutiny and accountability on assisted living facilities to try to make sure that people would have much more comfort with using those types of options. Again, 
with the goal of trying to keep people out of traditional nursing homes along the way. Okay. And I think you'll see much more emphasis on that in the years ahead, precisely because political reality is Pennsylvania is a senior citizen dominated state and seniors, I'll be very frank with you, seniors vote. Yeah. Hey, that's where you all have power that are working with seniors. The most ironclad political science law is the 45 degree correlation between age and likelihood to vote. Okay. Of course, you all remember back from your stats class, 45 degree correlation means the perfect correlation. So simply put, it's an inexorable law of politics that the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. And that gives seniors tremendous political power to push on the system for initiatives and changes they would like to see. Because politicians know that that is a key demographic voting block. And, and you know you've got to pay attention to what that group wants. So, and they should, they should express themselves. That's where I would encourage people uh, who work with the seniors in general, is encourage the seniors to express themselves. Some do, obviously, but you also have a lot that are still coming out of that Great Depression-ish, World War II-ish kind of generation, okay, who were basically, in terms of political culture and ethos, were sort of politically socialized, that you don't really question authority, that you don't really demand that the political system, per se, do anything. I mean, my mother-in-law, who's 85, hey, to her, and, and I love my mother-in-law, it's not one of these mother-in-law jokes coming, <laughs> turn that tape off, Molly, but, you know, my, my mother-in-law, God bless her, hey, she will not ever question what a doctor tells her, all right? in part because she has just always been under the almost unconscious belief right, that a doctor is God, and you don't, well, we don't question doctors. Now, obviously somebody, my generation and, and, and others, you don't even think twice about asking the doctor to clarify or challenging what the doctor is telling you, but it's a different culture. And it's the same thing. I find a lot of seniors that I work with in my district and others, there are tremendous benefits that are available to them, which we can talk about, tremendous benefits. But the Great Depression-ish, World War II-ish generation, they, obviously it's in part about culture in the sense that there's a certain pride there that you don't ask anybody for anything and you certainly don't expect the government to do something for you. So there's a, a strong reticence at times. And I often find in my world as a legislator, it's actually when the adult child or some neighbor brings in the senior that we can finally start to give them the opportunity to apply for some of the benefits that they've earned. And that's what I always try to give comfort to the seniors, that this is not welfare per se, in the sense of what people think welfare is. These are earned benefits that we can talk about. You know, if, if you spent your life here in Pennsylvania, you've paid taxes presumably for 50 plus years, you've presumably contributed to communities in some way. Many of these individuals, of course, are the generation where almost everybody still served in the military, so you've done that part of your contribution. So I try to encourage the seniors that what's in these handouts is something that you've earned. And since you've earned it, and, you, and if you feel like it would be helpful to you, there's no reason to be reticent about accepting what's possible to have. Okay. But it often, I find, takes some other person, adult children, neighbor in Lions Club, whatever else, to bring that person in and, and get the process going. Because I will also point out that in the um, budget pie about human services, which is the second to last page, of that 39% that goes to human services, which are where a lot of the issues that I'm sure you're interested in fall, maybe, maybe one percentish is what you and I and many other people would think of as welfare, in the sense of cash 
assistance in the traditional sense of the word or the benefit checks or the access cards these days. Most of this that is made up of human services, this actually is where your senior citizen programs are funded from. This is children and youth. This is intellectual disabilities. This is autism. This is drug and alcohol rehabilitation, among any number of other issues. This is veterans care. But there's sometimes can be reticence for seniors and others at, at times to think of what they are accepting as a benefit is welfare and all these connotations that, that go with that. But 1% of that 39% is what you and I would, would think of as, as welfare per se. Okay. And what's interesting too is, is I, I learned that my first year in the legislature because this is a classic case where semantics matter, right? Semantics matter. Long story short, my first year in the legislature, this, was, this slice of the pie, officially by the state government, was still termed public welfare. That was the official term for that part of the pie. Okay. Sent out my first newsletter to my district. I was all proud of myself to throw these budget pies in and tell the citizens all the good things that I had done in my first budget. Okay. And I was, from my perspective, I was proud of the fact that it was a balanced budget. We didn't take on new debts. There were no new taxes. And so I was like, this is a good fiscal responsibility measure. I couldn't believe the blowback I was getting from almost immediately all kinds of citizens emailing me saying, Dwayne, how could you? How dare you? You put you said you were going to be a, a different kind of representative. You said you were about fiscal responsibility. You said you were about having individuals take responsibility for their own lives. How could you put 40% of our tax dollars into welfare? Or it was 40% of that year. But again, it's because what people are here, the word welfare, they were thinking of the traditional checks or the traditional, these, at this point, the access cards. They weren't thinking in terms of mom and dad, great aunt Sally, uncle John, okay, the veterans programs, the senior citizen programs, the children and youth programs, the foster care, all the foster care, all the adoption programs, that all falls in the, what now is known as human services, in time public welfare. So when you start to explain that to people and say, well, do you like having people that need a referral for a drug and alcohol organization, do you think that's an important function? Well, yes. Do you think that kids that are born, regrettably for them, with a lifetime of some sort of intellectual disability, and mom and dad eventually go to pass on, should there not be a place for them to go? Well, yes, of course. And so on. And we go through that litany, all of a sudden, public welfare is seen as support care for the kind of people that they were looking around and seeing every day and saying, well, you know, these are good people. They, they may have, have, have had some hard times and or just the natural aging of, of life has brought on some issues. So a few years after that, I, and, and I, I won't take complete credit for this, but I will say this because I have to say it. I got smart in my mind. My very next year, I actually started calling this part of the budget pie on my own. I, I sent out a, a legislative directive on my own, to, at, least, at least to my staff, and said, we're going to start calling this human services. Part of actually tapping back to my time as a professor here and knowing the realities of public administration, what that really was. I said, we've we got to do this smart politically. And change it to human services on anything you send out from me. And we started doing that even before the state officially changed the term. The next year, I didn't, same basic pie actually, I didn't get one complaint. Okay. Not one complaint. Semantics matter along the way. Okay. But I'll just um, quickly just call your attention to a few more items I would think about and I'd certainly be happy to start uh, taking any questions or comments and can revise and extend my remarks from there. Okay. 
The other piece I would think about in terms of advocacy and issues of importance to you is this relationship between the, what's called the floor and the committee system, which is the next page. Okay. These are critical points of access for issues that you might be interested in and working on for a couple of reasons. And actually, if you're searching for me, I'm in seat 18. So, you know, seat 18. <laughs> there you go. Oh, C18. Uh, just 18. Oh, 18. Yeah. There are roughly, roughly, okay, 4,000 bills that get introduced in every legislative session. 4,000. So, needless to say, anybody who's being candid with you is going to tell you that no, you have not read every single bill. It is, volume-wise, it's impossible. So that's why I think this classic contemporary example of the Affordable Care Act slash Obamacare, whether one agreed with it or not as a mechanism for care, one of the criticisms that came out of it was an allegation that nobody had read the bill. Now, I would, I'll tell you candidly, I, I, I'm not the biggest advocate for, the, for Obamacare, just to be in full disclosure. But what I will say is I think it was a little bit unfair, this charge, that nobody had read the bill. And who did read the bill, though, was not every single person on the floor. Okay. Who did read the bill okay. was the relevant committee of jurisdiction. Health and Human Services Committee. Because of this reality, this is where you, where you want to think about focusing your attention on issues of importance to you, is the reality is, in the legislator's life, your geographic district, that's your world, in terms of how you think about and how you see the world. In the capital, so geographic district's your home. Right, so 156, 167. Nobody knows these numbers, but you just give places of reference. Like I say, to people, I represent the General Malvern area, and that kind of means something to people. And Dan Truitt might say, I represent the General Westchester area, whatever else. But in the capital, your world is which one of these roughly 25 standing committees, which three do you serve on? That is so key to what you are able to focus on as a legislator. Because the reality is, even though the images of a legislative body, whether it's the movies, TV shows, the newspapers, it's always a dramatic kind of pan of two legislators down what we call the well, which basically means one person behind one podium, another person behind the other podium, and they're debating. That's called the well of the floor. It's the front center area. You spend maybe 10% of your time on the floor in terms of what you do as a legislator. The vast majority of your policy time is really the work that you do on these committees. Okay. For the simple reason that division of labor 4,000 bills, as I ask everybody to sort of do the mental math on as a quick sh snapshot, if you even spend one hour on each bill, which is not nearly enough, but if you did, that's 4,000 hours, of course. The government's definition of a standard work week is 2,000 hours, 50 weeks times 40 hours. So right then and there, you have doubled the time of what my term even is of two years. As a legislator in the House side, your world is a two-year election cycle and a one-year budget cycle. Okay. Every year we go through the process of putting together this budget. And you make dozens and dozens of votes based on this budget. This budget is due by June 30th every year in Pennsylvania. So Right now, if you're going to get interested in 
pushing for certain issues, this is, the, this is the key time to tune in, get engaged, and go get in front of people like me and tell them why we should put more money into senior citizen programs or whatever else might interest you. Because between now and June 30th, it's called the budget season in the Capitol. And this is when the biggest push comes for all these decisions and dozens of votes about how as citizens do you want your tax dollars spent? How much more do you want for higher education? Okay. Would selling Westchester, privatizing Westchester, or making it state related, okay, would that save the state significant dollars? That's, that's a point of debate at this point. Would privatizing the state store system save the state dollars in some way, shape, or form? Okay. Would it help community development, in the sense of economic development, in some way, shape, or form? So this is the key time between now and June 30th. Because June 30th, unlike Washington, there's actually is a real deadline to balance the budget. So that's one reason that I point out uh, that I'm, at least from my perspective, uh, it is good that we have a constitutional requirement to balance the budget in Pennsylvania. We are not allowed to go into the kind of debt that, in this case, $17 trillion that the federal government is now well, all of us really are, are in at this point. The state level, you have to have a balanced budget by law. It has to be done by June 30th every year. Okay. The last two years, it has literally been 10 minutes of midnight on June 30th going into July 1st that we've been standing on the floor making our final votes on the budget. So as I, when I joke with uh, college classes, it's, it's no different than that last minute term paper that, kids are always scrambling to get done just in time. Some things never change. Uh, but it does have to be done by midnight on June 30th, because July 1st starts the next fiscal year. So j this July 1st will start fiscal year 2015 in the state, and all the implications about what's been decided about how much more is appropriate for education, how much more is appropriate for nursing homes, how much more is appropriate for foster care programs whatever the issue is. And there's a linkage there because, as I'm sure some of you are aware, there's been a, a steady rise in the last 10, 15 years of the number of grandparents that have full, partial, informal or informal custody of their grandkids. And that's an area of the law that we are trying to get caught up on because that's a relatively new phenomenon in, in terms of the grandkids being literally the legal custody of the grandparents. Now, from my perspective, I find that disheartening at some level because of the reasons why that's the case. It's probably a story for another day. But the reality is that's something we've been looking at, of senior citizens who have some substantial custody of their grandkids. We've got to give them full legal rights in terms of what they're able to do in the name of that child. Because whatever reasons, the, the parent is out of the picture and grandmom and granddad are making the decisions about where to go to school, health care, applying for their benefits, whatever else might be needed and necessary in that situation. And the law is, is trying to catch up with that uh, demographic phenomenon uh, that we're seeing. So I'll just close uh, on that by saying you spend probably literally 80% of your time on your, one of your three committees. And that's where you really focus as a legislator. So whatever issues you're interested in, a key point of access is your home legislator for one. But beyond that, which legislators are the committee of jurisdiction for an issue that I'm interested in? Okay. That's where the the lobbying effort, the advocacy effort, the citizen outreach really needs to happen. Because this is pure power. I, mean, I, know, I know some don't always like to hear this, but the reality is, in a legislative body, okay, it is next to impossible, despite Hollywood, it is next to impossible to stand up on the floor and make a dramatic speech that I'm going to introduce such and such a bill that I want you all to vote on and make it law.
the reality is these committees are huge, huge gatekeepers. Okay. 99.9 .9 to infinity, and there's always one exception, so I'm giving myself an out. 99.9% <laughs> of the time, the committee of jurisdiction has to recommend something to go to the floor. Otherwise, it just remains at the committee level. If it remains at the committee level, it means it's not getting to the main floor. Not getting to the main floor means it can't be voted on to become a law. So that's why I always encourage people that if you really want to advocate for something, the key part really is to get connected with, build relationships with, rapport with individuals who serve on the committee of jurisdiction of the issues that you're interested in. Because all those 4,000 bills get re what's called referred. They get referred to one committee. So there's only one and only one committee that's going to have control, if you want to use that term, football, of that bill, that idea that you're interested in. And, and you've got to focus attention on that committee. Okay? Because unless and until the committee of jurisdiction says, send it forward, okay, a majority of us agree that it's something worth doing, okay, it's going to stay in that committee. Huge, huge gatekeeper role. Now, I will quickly add, it's not quite as nefarious as that might sound per se, because what it does do is this allows subject matter expertise to develop. You, you want legislators who are serving on the Aging Older, Older Adults Committee, presumably you, you want them to develop a certain amount of expertise about aging issues. You want somebody who's serving on the Health Services Committee who's interested in uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs. You want that person to develop a certain amount of expertise about drug and alcohol research methodologies. The whole idea of the committee system is to build that expertise. Because on the floor, in the, on the floor, in HR terms, we are all generalists. We're voting on hundreds of bills some of which we may know something about, some of which we may know little about, but we still vote on them because that's your, your, your legal obligation. Okay. Legislators on the floor are generalists, okay, unless it happens to be a bill that you worked on. Okay. Legislators in committee are specialists because you're not worried about what's going on in, in 22 other committees. I mean, you are, but in the sense of where you focus your time. Okay. You're focusing on how do I become an expert on certain topics because of what committees that you serve on. Okay. So a certain amount of expertise. Of the 203 legislators, the committees are roughly 20 to 35 subset of that. So each of these committees, roughly 20 to 35 legislators are served. And you're basically the leaders for the entire rest of the House. So if the Committee on Aging and Older Adults says that, yes, we want to require the Pennsylvania Lottery to maintain a guaranteed profit margin, okay, and they recommend a certain way to do that to the rest of the House, that's probably going to get favorable consideration because you know your colleagues are the experts on aging issues. This is where the real work of legislation gets done. This is what people think of when they think about people doing amendments, doing rewrites of bills, doing line-by-line -line reviews of bills, listening to testimony, listening to witnesses, seeing somebody up at the presenter's table being interrogated by a legislator. That's where it all happens in the committee system. By the time it gets to the main floor, I don't want to leave you the impression that, that it is a pro forma vote, but 90% of what's been decided has been decided in the committee system. So you've got to get there, that early access, and start to shape the direction of anything you're interested in along the way. Because the committee, if it says yes, there's a pretty good chance it's going to get heavily favored on the floor. No guarantees. Now, the committee doesn't want something to move forward. It's just going to simply let it sit. 
Because again, you can't just propose things on the floor. Because it's got to be vetted in the committee system first along the way. And maybe 10% of bills will eventually get through the committee system. So it's, it's a very powerful gatekeeper role along the way. I, I can do anything people want. <laughs> You're, you're, going be, you're going to be on tape in perpetuity, so. Transportation is a big issue for seniors. And so can you, because we either have contact with someone who's an older person, or we are an older person, is there a way that we can access the transportation committee so that we can contact them or get a group organized to contact them? In other words, I agree with you. Early access is the only way it for, on any of these issues. But for someone in a rural part of the state to, to say that it isn't important to have public transportation when they're driving a huge vehicle that is eating up all sorts of gasoline, which means we're further dependent upon for foreign oil. I mean, I think it's time, if this, if this is a state with so many retired people, if this is a state that supposedly is a good place for people to retire, then we do have to mobilize. We do have to get in touch with the Transportation Committee or the Education Committee. How can we access these people? That's my question. Sure, I know, great, it's a great question. A, a couple of suggestions is, one, it's deceptively simple, but be willing to come to Harrisburg. And I say that in the sense that every day in Harrisburg that we're in session, there are three or four or five major outreaches going on. There's, there's certain what I call themes of the day taking place. So just Wednesday, just, which was our last day this week, we were in voting session, Penn State Agricultural Extension was having its day in Harrisburg. And there were, I know it's not your issue, but to make the point, there were dozens of buses of students, faculty, farmers, and others that were brought into Harrisburg, okay, and their job was to go around the Capitol, distribute to people like me these, we call them packets, these packets of information that say, here's why agriculture funding from an education and economic development perspective makes sense in Pennsylvania. Here's why, again, it's budget season. Here's why as we move toward that June 30th deadline, you need to support agriculture in the state. So their job is to go around and make an impression on, on legislators. Yeah, you, people hate to hear this word, but, but you've got to be citizen lobbyists. People hate that word because it's got connotations. But a lobbyist is just an advocate. Right? Do I just show up or? You can do a couple things. These uh, committee, I don't want to leave the impression that these committee systems are somehow non-transparent compared to the main floor, because that impression sometimes is out there with citizens. These committees are every bit as public record and every bit as sunshine, as we call it, as the main floor. So any citizen, when the committee's meeting, has the right to go in and watch the committee in action. So what day, when? It's a, it's, there's a House of Representatives website, and on there, by law, we have to disclose when committees are meeting. There's a sunshine agenda that has to be put out. Okay. And it's also on the website which legislators are comprise which committee. So you, you can go to the particular ones that really are working uh, substantially day in and day out on that, on that particular committee. And the more the presence, the better. Now, when I go back next week, it's, it's Social Workers Day in Harrisburg. There are going to be thousands of social workers all over the Capitol, and they should be. They coming to meet with people like me to talk about licensing requirements, to talk about education requirements, there's a group here from Westchester that 
been pushing the idea about the undergraduate social work degree in effect getting to count for the licensing exam. So they've, they've lobbied me the last three years on that. I voted the right way on it, by the way. But you've got to find 101 other people to, to agree. But they're doing the right thing. You, you've, out of sight, out of mind. It's really out of sight, out of mind. It's, next week, when I go back, I know it's not your issue, but just if, when you think about how phenomenal this is, the mushroom growers okay, are going to be in the capital. It, it's an issue that, candidly, intellectually, I have no interest in, but it's important to somebody. Okay, and, and the mushroom growers are going to be there talking to legislators about certain tax issues, certain immigration issues, certain e-verify issues, because it affects their livelihood. Every single coalition has some sort of outreach day in Harrisburg. I wouldn't, in your case, for, for that particular matter, I wouldn't reinvent the wheel, because you've got the ability to fall in with some existing groups. I mean, I would get a little bit more attuned to what's going on if you're not already with, with AARP, because holy smokes, AARP is one of the biggest lobbying groups in the capital. It shocks people to hear this. Nobody wants to hear that. But AARP is one of the biggest lobbying groups in the capital. I, I would, and they have their days where they organize seniors to come up there, make a presence on people like me. Hey, there's uh, actually a Westchester graduate uh, started a group called, I'm a little off the name, I think, but it, Alliance of Retired Persons or, or something like that. He's undergrad here from Westchester, okay. and it's supposed to be sort of a, another advocacy um, organization for senior citizens. Can I just, uh, just a little postscript? SEPTA, for instance, Regional Rail uses the Amtrak train lines. I mean, that's, that's a great benefit. I mean, in Amtrak, those are Amtrak's lines, but SEPTA uses them. So, I mean, why aren't there more, I mean, there should be more transportation, not less money allocated for transportation. It saves all sorts of, of money as far as fuel, the environment, all these things. I, I just don't understand why there isn't even more regional rail. When you come to Harrisburg, I'm going to introduce you to my office mate who represents Clearfield County, and I'm going to let you make that argument to him. I lived in Germany in, in, in the 80s, 70s and 80s. I had socialized medicine, which was fabulous, and I paid on a sliding scale. The transportation system was phenomenal. I never owned a car, I didn't have to. There was no crime. Everyone was happy intellectually. Universities maintained and schools maintained a high degree of, of excellence. This idea of this governor and the Republican right that social pro all social programs are bad, that, that's a perception that we need to start trying to change because it is further eroding the quality of life even for the most wealthy people in the state. So I'm trying to figure out a way to get people fired up as I told you, to begin to say something about this. It's not up to somebody else to do it. It's up to people to start to stand up. So No, you're you're on the right track, no pun intended. Okay. You're on the right track. It, it does have to be, and I voted for the transportation bill, because I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just kidding with you, but I do agree with, with your arguments, and, and they, they were persuasive to me, but that is the reality, though, is anything has got to be persuadable to 102 people like me, and for some, given their, either their ideology or the kind of district they come out of, they are not persuaded by the need for more fast transit. They could be persuaded if there was a way to make them convinced that it was a bad idea not to be more supportive of, of, of mass transit. Uh, but that's gonna take, I agree, it's gonna take citizens getting even more engaged in the process. 